pull it up for you and sure turn it all over to you. Okay. Okay. Um, presenting on a 26 year old female who was diagnosed with hep C this past November. And she has a long history of substance abuse, um, started using alcohol, THC at age 14, and she had used um, Xanax, meth, and opiates. And she said the very first time she um, used IV, drugs, she borrowed some from another person that was um, hep C positive, and she had only done that two times. Um, she is now trying to get her life back together. She's been in MAT for about one year. Um, she's single, no children. She wants to be a nurse, and she is employed. Um, and she's living with her boyfriend who got out of jail recently. And um, she has expressed uh, concern about that in the past, but she seems to have, um, you know, her groups with Matt and also some support people in her life. Um, she has um, chronic low back back pain with sciatica, neck pain, she is a smoker, and she has a history of migraine headaches and depression, anxiety, and bipolar disorder. She, um, she has had a very rough childhood. Um, she was abused uh, sexually, emotionally, and physically, and um, had been in detention centers and um, so it's, you know, I think it, it's pretty amazing that she is at this point, um, and is doing so well. And there you can see her medications. Um, she is up to date on her Hep A, and she had her last um, Hep B when I saw her uh, recently in the office. So we'll test her for that again. Um, she, um, so her, la I caught this later, her uh, white count, this was in November, the first time she was seen, her white count was 12. And so we will repeat that when she comes back in. But her blood, um, blood work looks pretty good. Hemoglobin 15.6, platelets were okay. Um, BUN creat, ALT, AST, the total and direct bilirubin. APRI, child trichopu, and male scores were good. So her first viral load done in November was 2,970. So when she came in to see me, um, I repeated the viral load. It had been six months and it had gone down to 690. Um, and I'm not really sure exactly you know, what that means, but, um, so my questions were, um, could that, this mean that her body is fighting off the hep C? Um, and I think she could take Maverick, Eclusa, Harboni, or Zapatier, but when I went by the guidelines, um, it seemed like Maverick or Harboni, both for eight weeks, would be, um, I guess, the choices. Um, looks like she does not have any cirrhosis. Um, she's not on a PPI. Um, so I think she is close to being ready for treatment. 
and I, I would welcome all input. That was excellent. Thank you so much, Tammy. Um, so any comments, questions, recommendations for Tammy in the case? Hey, Tammy, nice to see you. Um, was her concern about her boyfriend is, and was his um, prison term, was that for substance use disorder? Is that what she's worried about? Or? Um, no, I think it was, and uh, that he, he was in jail, but I guess her concern that he would continue to use drugs when he got out. And I, you might have said, or it might have been on that med list, is, what, what's her contraceptive method? Um, she, let's see, she has a, um, I think she has a marina. Gotcha. Yeah, I think she has something. Any other comments or um, recommendations from the hub members? Tammy, this is Kaylee. Um, thanks so much for presenting your case, and thanks, Jen, for bringing up the birth control. That was uh, that was one of the, the questions that um, Dr. Gilfus and I were discussing as far as a treatment regimen. Um, so, Tammy, your question about the viral load decreasing, um, you know, we kind of tend to use a six-month period um, for you know, deferring treatment to assess whether or not spontaneous clearance is going to occur. However, um, there are plenty of cases to where they, they can still spontaneously clear even up to a few years after. And so, um, you know, if her viral load is, was so kind of low baseline, um, it would be helpful, you know, if she had any kind of symptoms suggestive of acute hepatitis in the few months prior to her November testing. Um, her liver enzymes were already normal then, but, you know, some clues that may suggest this was a more recent infection. But if, if you know, most of the time, two thirds of the time, people don't have symptoms of, of acute hepatitis. So that's not always helpful. Um, uh, but, you know, I would err on the side of just kind of watching her for a little bit longer. Um, could you treat her? Absolutely. Um, and exactly what you said, you know, Maverick for eight weeks um, or Carvoni for eight weeks would be reasonable. They're the shortest duration. Um, the oral concert, or I'm sorry, the contraception she's on, if she is on Mirena, it's not going to um, be an issue with the Maverick that we tend to consider with some of the um, estradiol containing regimens. And then mm -hmm. if Rachel might want to just comment, because there's a couple like the Rizitriptan that I'm not um, too sure about it. If Rachel, if you can just run a quick um, interaction profile. But, you know, I had a patient that um, had been in care with me when she was pregnant and had a low viral load and we kind of deferred treatment. She um, came back into care really about a year and a half after she delivered and um, still had positive viremia. And then I kind of reordered her follow-up lab work and this is over two years later and she's been undetectable now for over six months. So you know, there are some instances where it does just take them a little bit longer to clear. So that's, that's certainly an option. I kind of would propose it to her as, you know, we could treat you now if that's what you wanted, but you know, why start a medication if we can just watch it for a little bit longer to see if maybe you don't even need it. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, those were, those would technically be the two options I would um, consider with her. Do you have anything else to well, yeah, um, I, I guess to get back to the initial part, you said, are there any recommendations or suggestions? I don't really have a lot of those, but I have compliments. Mm -hmm. uh, I, want, I want to compliment your advanced thought process, uh, Tammy. Very, very nice. Um, independent management of this patient is, uh, you know, perfect. You're doing great. Um, and, and the birth control question from Jennifer, absolutely. Hey, um, so... And I just had a second to look up this while, while Kaylee and I were talking about 10 minutes before conference here. 
how often this happens. So, you know, if we separate the concepts into, you know, acute hep C clears often, um, you know, who knows how. We used to quote 15%, it's probably way up more towards 30 or 30 plus percent. So, but this is, the other question comes up is how often does chronic hep C clear? So after six months, what's the rate? And like Kaylee and I were talking, we've seen a couple cases. So it does not happen frequently. And um, this was a, this is a case series, looks like um, from 2016, where they followed people from 1994 to 2013 with no treatment. And of 10,000 people, um, 10,300 people that they followed over time, 50 of them cleared spontaneously after developing chronic hep C. So 50, and that comes out to you know, 0.36 per 100 patient years. Median duration was 50 months. Um, so it can, it can happen, but, um, and it said risk, or I should say uh, younger age and female gender. Um, and, and interestingly enough, this one I would not guess on, but hepatitis B co-infection can actually um, be in your favor. So gender, age, and hep B co-infection. Thought process there is probably hep B flares periodically. And every time it flares, it sort of creates an immunologic milieu where your body can do funny things. And uh, perhaps clearing your chronic hepatitis is one of those. But, but um, anyway, just to, to, to support what Kaylee and I have seen anecdotally, it can happen. It's just not common. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, re remember, um, the the change in viral load there is is a log it's not like a super dramatic decrease from like 100 million or even a million down to 600 you know this was from a low log to a low log so um i actually think it probably won't clear but man i, I proved me wrong i love it it'd be great <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you hi and this and is Rachel. Just to take Rachel, was there a, a comment you wanted to make? Yeah, sorry. Um, I just wanted to, to piggyback on what they were saying from a drug interaction standpoint with any of the available regimens, um, no major issues with the triptans or any of the um, other medications on here. Um, but I also wanted to point out because her insurance is Medicaid, remember this year that they did change their preferred regimens. So Harvoni would not be an option for her in this case. Um, they prefer Maverick, Epclusa, and um, Zepatir. Okay. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you, everyone, for the comments and recommendations and everything. Um, Tammy, were there any other questions that you had for the group uh, about your case, or um, did that address everything? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I did say, um, looked back and she does have a marina and was using condoms. So that was her two types of birth control. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Any other final comments, questions, thoughts? Um, we did get some questions and great stuff in the chat. So definitely take a look at that as well. But um, before moving on to the next case, any other thoughts, questions? All right, perfect. Thank you so much, Tammy. That was an excellent case presentation. Um, really appreciate it. So, um, okay, so on to the other case that we have. Uh, Dr. Bailey, I will pull it up for you and the floor is yours. Oh, I'm so sorry, Dr. Bailey. I think you might have been muted for that uh, brief. I, I was. I got it, though. Thanks for that little pop-up that comes up and tells you. So, <laughs> um, and if you guys can't hear for a background noise, please let me know. We're, we're enjoying the sunshine, um, but there's an air conditioner and a road, so you never know what you might hear. Um, so this is a 45-year-old female. There comes the air conditioner. Um, <laughs> And she was picked up on screening when she established care at our facility. Um, we've got most of our providers pretty well trained to screen for hepatitis C and all of our patients at this point. 
Um, and this lady uh, established with one of a very seasoned nurse practitioners um, and she picked up the hepatitis C on screening. Um, at, after she was diagnosed, the patient uh, revealed that she did have a history of both alcohol and drug use, um, but she had been clean for one year, four months, and she was a patient that um, she, I think through religion and um, through family support and wanting to make sure that she didn't compromise her relationship with her children, um, she was using abstinence and um, has actually done pretty be good with that. She was keeping up with how long she had gone without alcohol or drugs. First time we saw it was about a year and four months. The five series. Um, and if you want to start to scroll down a little bit, we'll start going through her labs. So everything looked pretty good as far as her labs. Her um, platelets were normal. Her kidneys looked fine. Her um, albumin, her INR, and her liver enzymes all looked normal. Um, her bilirubin protein was all good. Um, her iron studies were pretty much normal. Her iron saturation, oddly enough, was pretty low, but otherwise everything normal. Um, her HIV was normal. Her AFP was normal. Her viral load was relatively low at 106,000. Um, go down a little bit further. They reached the end of the line for some reason. Yeah, it looks like that is the end of the document for the case. Oh, okay. So we're, yeah, there, there was more. So that's okay. Um, I've got her pulled up here on the EHR. So I'll just finish telling you about her. She was a genius type. And um, her, her, um, the other score that I can't remember that we do, <laughs> we're all normal. So she's a really have any significant liver damage to her substance history. And I think we had done a urine drug screen on her as well that was negative. Um, and so, uh, you know, she's, she's kind of being a relatively, um, relatively, uh, healthy patient at this point. Her medications, um, she's on albuterol for asthma, um, amitriptyline, amlodipine, benazapril for her blood pressure. Um, we gave her a fluconazole once or twice for a yeast infection. Um, she's on hydrochloric acid, 25 milligrams. Hydroxyzine, 25 milligrams, um, and then pantoprazole, Zantac, and Simbacort for her asthma as well. Um, so my plan for her was we have already gotten the two separate um, two separate viral loads that were six months apart. She does have West Virginia Medicaid, so um, we took a look at their formulary, and the preferred is going to be. Um, Mavreed or Epluza, um, and we'll probably go with the Mavreed for eight weeks since she's on that PPI. Um, that shouldn't give her any drug interactions. And that's about it. Thank you so much, Dr. Bailey. I apologize. There was some connection issues, but we did see in the chat the genotype uh, is three. So thank you for that. Um, that was excellent. No problem. Um, let's see. So any comments, questions? Um, if there was some connection issues, feel free to ask us. Um, maybe we can have Dr. Bailey um, explain that again. I think I'm losing you. I'm going to try to move inside or we might have better bandwidth, sadly. <laughs> no worries at all. <laughs> oh, can you guys turn the yeah. Definitely use the chat feature as well. That, that definitely is a lifesaver in times like this. So, okay. 
Exactly. I'll give you guys a nice tour of Friendly Gary, West Virginia. <laughs> Oh, they're having lunch. It's going to go off. Okay, we should be able to hear you a little bit better at this point. Yes, this definitely seems like the connection is getting stronger there. Yeah, good. Thank good you. you. <laughs> Moving closer to the source. It was good when we first went out there, but. You know how that goes. All right. What did you guys have questions about? What did you miss when I was trying to be outside? <laughs> yes, any questions or comments? Hey, Joanna, it's John. Um, huh? The uh, quick question, do, you, do we know when her risk factor for acquisition was? We know she stopped uh, doing drugs like a year ago, but uh, do we know how young she could have been when she acquired this by any chance in, in, in hindsight questioning? I believe, and Jenny, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I believe it had been quite a while since she had used any IV drugs. Um, it wasn't a year ago, it was maybe more like 10 years ago. Okay, Th yeah, the only point I bring it up, and for that, any of you who are new on the call, is you know, the genotype three in general, the, the genotypes, we don't pay as much attention to them as we used to. Mm -hmm. um, there's really two reasons to look at genotype, and one is for regimen selection, um, and, and uh, that's becoming uh, de-emphasized now that we have pan-genotypic agents with Mavri and Eplusa. And of course, the other reason to look at genotype is um, association with the rate of progression. And even though she's 45 years old, if she um, used drugs 20 years ago, um, a genotype three patient can already be cirrhotic um, by that time period. Mm. Uh, we don't, you, you want to remember that in general, um, the rate of fibrosis progression might be increased by up to a decade in genotype three compared to other genotypes. So, um, um, and, and Joanna, this was just because we couldn't hear you with the connection, but um, were her fibrosis scores and stuff like that? Okay, I know the APR are like good at point two. Did she get a fibro short? Yeah. Or, um, okay. Yes. She had okay. a fibro short and she was F zero. Oh, yeah. Her, yeah. And her platelet count her, looks good. Yeah. Platelet count looks good. And, and uh, you know, it's one of these cases do you do liver imaging or not? Yeah. And we checked, we found it. Her last. Oh, her last drug use was three years ago. Thir oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, and, and actually, so the first drug use would probably be even the more interesting question. Um, mm -hmm. Give you, uh, you know, the absolute longest. Um, I, I know we always talk about the sobriety period, and, and, I, and I myself always forget to ask that question when I'm seeing patients. It's, uh, yes, the most recent drug use is interesting, but uh, sometimes prognostic is when their first drug use was, um, at least from the hepatitis C standpoint, to mm -hmm. give you a quantity and, and at age 45 believe it or not you could you could have a uh, cirrhotic range uh, duration if you if you started as a teenager or 20 something year old so but yeah hey uh, your thought process looks beautiful you know Maverick or Eclusa and, and I love the fact that you avoided Eclusa because of the PPI so um yeah she should do great um any other questions from yourself or the or the rest of the members I think we're pretty comfortable with her. She's hopefully will be somebody we can get treated and mark her off the list. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Bailey. That was excellent. Uh, Thank you. No other comments, questions from the group? We do still have about 30 minutes actually left. Uh, we could discuss anything on the table here how everyone else is doing, how your clinics are, maybe some other interesting cases someone might want to bring up.
I actually have to hop off. I have another meeting that's um, that's going to happen in just a couple minutes. But I appreciate you guys very much. I hope everybody's still doing well and safe in your clinics. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Bailey. It was great to see you. I have a question. Um, it's it was well, kind of Hep C, not Hep C. Uh, mini case. Um, I have a sixty. I'm sorry, seventy one year old patient. Um, <clears throat> who was hep C antibody positive, but with a negative viral load, um, and found to be core antibody positive when I first got him probably 16, 18 months ago. He's um, still a drug user, and when I can catch him for office visits, frequently tries to dodge repeat labs. Um, long story short, the main question is, I've started revaccination for him for hepatitis B, because he's got AFib um, and severe mitral valve regurg with heart failure, so he's not really a good candidate um, for any heart surgeries. And um, my concern about his chronic illness becoming so severe and reactivating his Hep B is, is a real thing for him. I believe he's had at least one round of Hep B vaccinations before I got him. Um, so the question is, when I finish, when I finally can grab him and finish his last hepatitis B vaccine, when do I recheck his hep B surface antibody? And then how quickly after that do we start another vaccine series if he's still negative? Right. Man, Jenna, that, that was, uh, that's not low hanging fruit. That's, uh, that's a heavy one. Okay. This is rural man. At West Virginia, but I frequently see him on a hospital discharge by walk-in. So it's my favorite. Yeah. <laughs> the challenging one, you know, um, the differential of isolated core positivity for Hep B is um, it, it entails a couple of different clinical um, scenarios, and uh, the 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 concomitant hepatitis C in the past is interesting and and uh but it makes me you know in, in general it sounds like you probably had genuine hep b um and uh, in that scenario vaccination is probably not important um but if you gave him a single shot and see if you boosted him that would be awesome like that that's sort of what i would do because I, I almost wonder if he just had um either he was cleared it on his own and just had an undetectable surface anti body um that that's the best option um the other possibility would be uh a, a, a false positive you know uh of the, of the core that's less likely um chronic active infection is still possible too um, so he's somebody you might grab a DNA level on just for fun. I have to B DNA level on. Okay, um, so you mean chronic active infection of Hep B? It's hard. Yeah, I mean you could if you have a core antibody positive and you mm -hmm. lack surface antibody, you always okay. have to be worried. You got to be worried because it seems like genuine exposure to a DNA virus. Throw into that mix possibly a hepatitis C exposure. And, uh, and I'm already confused, you know, at the level of interpreting, interpreting things. So, um, but if you did start his vaccine series again, you know, check his surface antibody after a single dose. And, and uh, if he was genuinely cleared and you gave him like a, a little booster, he should have massively detectable surface antibody quickly. Um, okay. In other words, you're not, you're not trying to induce primary immunity with a three shot series. If we're assuming he had cleared infection, but just his antibody dropped to low levels, a single shot should hopefully boost him up to a good spot. Um, if he has chronic active and his DNA is positive, there's no role for vaccination. Right. Um, the yeah. chronic positive or chronic active is that? Can we determine that at all with a surface antigen? You can. You can okay. sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. It was negative, which is why I yeah. wondered. So then, a DNA level would be appropriate if his antibody is still negative. It might be, yeah, I really okay. would, and, and, and every once in a while you can even contemplate E, you know, remember anti-E, um, so, so hepatitis B, mm -hmm. the E antigen and the anti-E, 
the anti-E positive, that's another marker that it was probably a real infection. Um, you know, if you develop anti-E. Uh, so, so, and again, I'm not talking hepatitis E, which is a thing in other countries. I'm talking the hepatitis B, the, the E antigen antibody. So in confusing cases like this, the honestly, what I do is collect every bit of information I can. So I get, you know, the hepatitis B surface antibody, antigen, E antibody, E antigen, DNA level, and, uh, and heck, I'd even probably check another hepatitis C PCR. Yeah, that's another real concern of mine because he still uses drugs. Um, right. Yeah. Well, he says he doesn't, but every time he gets hospitalized, his drug screens are positive. So you need all those variables to really make sense of him. Yeah. Well, okay. Man, I love that case. Will you give us some follow up on that? Because uh, yeah, yeah, he's really neat. Um, I was I kind of just been following him on and off over hospitalizations, and um, such an appreciative, nice guy. Um, but has obviously just made some really bad decisions and can't seem to get out of that cycle. His heart failure has been really um, difficult, and my main concern, what I discussed with him the last time, was I'm not sure this Hep B won't reactivate the next time you have a really bad heart failure flare um, and kill you. So, yeah, Hep, hep B flares are, are certainly real things in the setting of immunocompromised. Um, usually, you know, if you're surface antigen positive, those are the biggest concerns. Um, but if you're core antibody positive and you have not so formed a service antibody, those people are also a concern. So Okay. Thank you. But yeah, let us know. Get all that data if you don't mind, and then let's let's reconvene on him. That's cool. I'll do that, yeah. I would not doubt his hep C is positive. <laughs> I mean PCR, because it's one of the confusing things when you what one of the most common causes of isolated core positivity is concomitant active hep C. And Jenna, you may want to consider too, I mean, even if this testing doesn't show a detectable oh, yeah. DNA, um, <laughs> I would still periodically check it. Um, I mean, for Hep B? For Hep B. I don't yeah. think there's a, a, a good kind of guideline to say how often. Right. Um, I'd probably do six months. I would you do more mm -hmm. free? No, Just because, fine. you know, particularly if he, if he is still using and then, um, you know, also depending on his hep C, I mean, I would still still be testing him for that too, um, periodically as well. But yeah, I, w I wouldn't want and done it if he's, if he is just isolated core, but no hep B viremia, I would still periodically um, check him just in case. You know, Kaylee brings up a great point. One of my pet peeves is, um, you know, when, when we a lot of times will document people's serostatus as negative, in the hospital when they come in with it, uh, some complication of injection drug use. But um, we don't do follow-up convalescent studies, so to speak. Remember, if uh, anybody gets a needle stick, we all know that time zero does not help you document negativity, and we all know to do um, follow-up serologies. But sometimes we don't do that same process for someone who injects drugs. We don't remember to do the, the convalescent studies. Um, and so, uh, so yeah. So, John, were you saying that you thought that you wouldn't be surprised if his hep C was now positive? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Because when, when we first tested it, his antibody was reactive, but he had a negative PCR at the time. Yeah, but if you throw hep B in the, in the scenario, your, your hepatocyte is so confused. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's you can see sometimes hep B wins, sometimes hep C wins. And Interesting. Okay. Cool. I'll recheck him the next time I see him. Yeah, Thanks. Nicole like a cleared hep C, it's got to be multiple um, negative PCRs, um, especially with ongoing risk. So, uh, but yeah, we, Kaylee and I were just talking about a case and we've seen a couple that are, we have a negative uh, hep C PCR and then they turn positive again and um, especially throw hep B in that mix and, and uh, yeah, I would, I would not be surprised one bit if his next PCR is positive and then you can present it for treatment. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. So I was going to say. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Thanks a lot. Thanks for that, um, Jenna and Hub members. Um, Jen, did you have a question as well about the case? I, I, I have a, a question about one of my cases, which is kind of a good follow up to Jenna's, actually. Um, and I think you might have just given the answer, but I need a refresher. Um, or I, I thought I needed a refresher and you might have just given the answer. So I have a lady who I actually presented here a year ago 
<laughs> excuse me. And um, she, at that time, um, we, uh, Medicaid wasn't paying for treatment. Her fibrosis score was F1, I believe. And so she recently contacted me again and is interested in getting treatment now. And she was hep B surface and core antigen positive. I'm just, I'm talking slowly because I'm trying to look at the labs to verify that as I'm saying it. Um, I didn't think I would get a chance to ask this today. And her surface antigen was negative. This was all a year ago. And um, so um, um, I've, I repeated her hep, her hep C fibrosis score. Unfortunately, it looks like we didn't get a repeat. We'll have to call her back and we didn't get a repeat viral load because I know I'll need that for um, uh, Medicaid. So she's an F1, F2, she's a genotype three. So if she's surface antigen and core antigen positive, I don't have to worry about reactivation of Hep B. Is that right? Yeah, if she's surface antibody. Surface oh. antibody, that's what I meant. Surface antibody and core antibody. Now, and, and you can find exceptions to that rule if you do unbelievable immunosuppression. So um, the, the classics there are, um, undergoing bone marrow transplantation or uh, uh, infusion of that. I, I'm blanking on the drug, Rachel, you can probably help me. It's the anti-CD20 drugs. I think they're uh, uh, rem uh, Remicade or yeah, one, one of those anti-CD20 anti-hematologic yeah. like CLL. Am I getting the drug right name right there, Rachel? Remicade? Yeah, yeah, with Remicade for sure. Yeah. So, um, those, the drugs that have to have unbelievable amount of immunosuppression or scenarios like that, you can see somebody reactivate hepatitis B because remember it's a DNA virus, you never really cure it, um, even if their surface antibody is positive. But in any other scenario, such as treating their hep C, you don't have to worry about reactivation. Okay. You, know, you, you can give that patient, say they got bad poison ivy and you needed to give them prednisone, feel free. Okay. You're fine. You're, I could have. Ever, <laughs> yeah. Remember, we don't we don't talk about common forms of immunosuppression, but if you ever have a patient who has active Hep C, I'm sorry, wrong word, active Hep B, and you give them a blast of steroids for asthma, COPD, you know, poison ivy, you can induce a nasty flare mm -hmm. if they have active Hep B. But if it's if the scenario you're talking about where it's uh, immune control, uh, you're you're fine. Basically, in, unless you're a hematologist or a transplant doctor. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks so much. Yeah, it's yeah. Really helpful. I'm going to try to get her treated, which would be really nice. By the way, we see those re those reactivations, and it's 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 fascinating. Yeah, that, all that you you can reactivate even after uh, surface antibody positive if you really 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 crush the immune system, but it's not common. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah, we got a chat from Dr. Rex Rhodes saying thanks for the info about flares of uh, Hep B and steroids. It's good to know. So, do you guys remember there was a uh, an, uh, gentleman I'm blanking on his name. He was here transiently in Echo program um, as the hepatologist. Uh, he was Irish fellow, and I'm blanking on his last name, but super uh, super nice guy. Um, he had practiced hepatology back in the 1970s and uh, all the way into the 2010s and obviously was with ECHO for a few years, um, so must have been doing this up into 2017 or 18. Um, he said that long before the interferon era for hepatitis B, one of the things that they would do would be to induce a flare in stable patients who had hepatitis B by giving them, of course, steroids. And uh, I don't, don't, I do not recommend you anyone do this. This is historic information. But he would, uh, he said that their hepatology uh, group, this was in vogue at the time to give a, a blast of steroids to induce a hepatitis B flare. Because every time you have a hepatitis B flare, it's basically an acute hepatitis. And um, 
there is a chance of immune clearance at that point. And, uh, and that's also a very brazen problem because, you know, anytime you have an acute hep B, there's also a measurable mortality. Um, so the good news is you can cure somebody. The bad news is you can kill someone. Um, and so thankfully we don't do that anymore, but it's still fascinating. Um, and, uh, and we have seen unrecognized hep B get flared up from uh, inadvertent poison ivy and COPD therapy. Fascinating, you know, a little, little uh, course of prednisone and then somebody presents like they have an acute hepatitis. They didn't just catch it, it just woke up. And, uh, and again, the, the good news um, is they can potentially clear it after that episode. So unfortunately, hep C, nothing like that. It doesn't work like that for hep C. But. So just for the sake of um, the next time, um, if that patient of mine had been surface antigen neg surface antibody negative and core antibody positive, then I would get a DNA. A hep yeah, DNA. Surface. Surface antigen is the next step um, in general, but okay. but I really like to get both the E, anti E and DNA okay. while you're at it. Like yeah. you're talking to Jenna. Okay. Get them all. Get them all so you can really characterize your patient well. Okay. And, uh, yeah, and if it looks like it's active, then, then you be careful with any uh, treatment expression. Okay, yeah. awesome. Yeah, I wonder how they how they. Uh, Perform shared decision making on it can cure you or it can kill you. <laughs> Isn't that a fascinating story. Yeah, that was a. That's a wild story. That is certainly fascinating. Thanks for sharing that, Dr. Gilfus. Um, Dr. Peters Hesteran, it was nice seeing you. Take care. Um, we do have about. 13 more minutes. Uh, Tracy, I see you raised your hand. Do you have a question, comment? Yes, a question. I put it in the chat and Jenna was nice enough to put in a reply, but I want to make sure I was, uh, that I stated the issue clearly. I have a new patient who had a positive six months ago and a significant viral load, but there was no genotype. Will medicate, uh, and I repeated the labs yesterday to get the genotype, which I don't have them back yet, unfortunately. Will Medicaid accept that if I didn't have the genotype six months ago? They will? Okay. So that was the question. And if no one else has their hand up, I have another question. We were talking about this yesterday in clinic, and I wanted to ask Dr. Gilfus what he thought about when should we do an alpha-1 antitrypsin? Is there any benefit to it? Is there a patient population that we should do that with or? Yeah, um, great, great question. I, I wish my hepatology colleague was here. Um, I personally don't, uh, but uh, when I'm just working up hep C, um, the threshold of when to work up alternative etiologies of liver disease uh, is always a good one. and. Um, it tends to, I guess, for alpha-1 antitrypsin, I would look for any family history or any pulmonary disease, stuff like that. But um, in general, you like to be able to explain away in a patient's entire clinical presentation with a single process. So if, if you treated the patient and you had lack of resolution of liver enzyme abnormalities, that would certainly be a scenario where you would want to look for an alternative answer for liver disease. Um, I don't uh, tend to get a lot of those referrals. Um, tends to be something where you know you can you can uh, treat the patient, see if it gets better. If not, look for something else. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now I will tell you, our hepatology group does the exact opposite. Um, they tend to on day one uh, send whole bunches of studies looking for autoimmune hepatitis. They do the alpha-1 trypsin. They do all the iron studies on all that up front. Um, and it's all just approach. There's no right or wrong to it. My own approach is usually just treat the, treat the, the thing I know they have and see what gets better. Um, and, and, and that tends to be a fairly useful approach most of the time. But again, our, our liver docs do it a little bit differently than that. Okay. Sorry, no, no great answer, but that's my own approach. No, we were just talking about it in clinic yesterday, and I thought if I had a, ch a chance, I would yeah. just kind of throw it out there. You know, the, the other thing that would make me want to um, check it earlier is if I had maybe liver disease out of proportion to length of infection. So if you had somebody who just had a risk factor 
few years ago or not very old and already seem to have advanced liver disease, that's always something that makes you want to look for a second or third uh, problem, you know, iron overload, alpha one, something like that. So, yep, great question though. All right, thank you. Sure. Excellent, thank you everyone. Um, any other final questions, thoughts, comments? About 10 minutes left, nine minutes. <laughs> I don't want to keep you all longer than we yeah. do. Yeah, I'm, I might have to zoom off too to hit, to hit a patient. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, the, the clinical the, the duties are calling too. So, but That's I'm, great. Thank you guys. Awesome. Thank you all so much. One quick announcement before we all part ways. Our next session will be on July 9th and uh, Rachel Mitchell will be giving our didactic on HCV medication regimen. So uh, keep it out for the reminder for that and the zoom link to join thank you all so much thank you for the case tammy and dr bailey i know she's not here but um thank you all joining we'll see you guys next time bye